This is your life. This is who you are. This changes the way you understand yourself as a human being and every other human being. It changes what you mean by justification and adoption and sanctification and glorification. And it changes what you mean by why we do what we do. Everything is changed when we understand the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Well, good morning. How are we doing? I'm Russ. I get the honor of being the senior pastor here at Res. If it's your first time or if I've not met you, I'd love to meet you. I'm glad you're here today. Uh, this is called Real Christian Sunday or Real Seeker Sunday. You may not be a Christian, but uh, you take away an hour of sleep and you find out who really loves Jesus. <laughs> Some of you are single and you've been eyeing a single person in the church for a while and you're wondering, are they a woman of God or a man of God? If they're here today probably are a woman or a man of God. If they're not, you're probably mistaken, probably want to say no to that. I'm just kidding. Uh, we are excited that you're here. Uh, for a lot of people, you got to have the perfect conditions to come to church. You truly are the brave, the few, the proud, the real followers of Jesus, uh, not the Marines. But, you know, we're, we're just honored that you're here with us. We're starting a in the second week of a series called The Remnant. And we're looking at this passage in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. If you have your Bible, you can turn there. We're going to start there, and then like we did last week, we'll go to several other texts outside of the Bible here. Paul has given a succinct presentation of the gospel in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. A reminder. He says, I remind you of what I also received, that Jesus died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures. He was buried and he was raised in accordance with the scriptures. And then he appeared to Cephas and to the twelve. And so he starts rattling off these names. And so he talks about the message of the gospel that because of our sin, there had to be payment. Deuteronomy teaches us that without blood, there cannot be the payment of sin. We learn this through the sacrificial system that foreshadowed the sacrifice of Christ, that as blood was being poured out for the payment of sin, life for life, uh, that Jesus' blood will be poured out as a final payment for sin, so that in Christ we could, who have walked away from God and walked in sin, now be reconciled to God, be forgiven. And it would be just for us to be forgiven. It wouldn't be that God would change the rules and let some of us in and then hold the rules over other people's head, but he was the fulfillment of the rules. He was the fulfillment of the law, so that whosoever would believe in him could justly be forgiven and set free, not only from what they've done, but the, from the very person that they've been, so that in Jesus, through his resurrection, they could have hope that would overcome the grave, and not only a hope that would overcome the grave, but give them a raised life now, so that though moments before they came into faith with Jesus, they were dead in their sin, now moments later, they are resurrected in Christ and alive for his glory and alive filled with his spirit for his namesake throughout the world. It is the gospel. And it's not a message that we preach once and move away from, but it's the message that changes everything. It changes the way I view eternity. It changes the way I view relationships with others. It changes the way I view time. It changes the way I view myself. It changes the way everything is viewed. So when the gospel impacts your life, there is an aftermath. There is a wake. And many a believer has encountered uh, faith in Jesus only to struggle with this new identity, only to struggle with who am I and what does it look like to live life now. And so Paul, wanting to give an apologetic and an example of the impact of the gospel, list out several people from verse 5 of 1 uh, Corinthians chapter 15 to verse uh, 9 all giving us different character witnesses to the power and the possibility of what God can do when the resurrection hits a dead man's life. Does this make sense? And so he brings into account several people. One of the people he brings into account is Cephas. He's known as Peter. And last week we looked at how the resurrection intersects our failure. How does it eclipse our failure? What does it teach us about our failure? Peter fails God. He fails him not only before the cross, 
but Peter fails after the cross. Failure is a normal occasion, occurrence in all of our lives. But some of us are really good at covering up our failure, and some of us are really good at demonstrating failure uh, very loudly and publicly for everyone else. You've been called grace or a klutz, or maybe you just you know, continue to do the things you do not want to do and not know why you do them, right? Uh, but Peter fails. He promises, big promises, and he comes through with very little to no delivery. And as a result of it, there's a greed relationship. Jesus ultimately goes to the cross and he dies. But Jesus shows up in Peter's failure. When Peter went farther than he thought he could go, and he did the things that he never thought that he would do, he looks at the beach and there's Jesus standing waiting on him. And this is the beauty of the resurrection. It doesn't matter what you've done. It doesn't matter how far you've gone. Jesus keeps showing up. Because of his grace and his mercy and his patience, he shows up. And not only does he show up, because plenty of people will show up to the scene of an accident, but very few actually have the provisions to deal with what's happened in the accident. You ever notice that? Whenever I slip up and I fail, there's a lot of people that come around, but not everyone that comes around whenever you slip up and fail is out for your good. Some people are actually out for your demise. Am I preaching good so far? Y'all are really quiet. Some people show up to see the wreck. Jesus shows up to bring provision to move you forward. And he always has the provision when you've gone farther than you thought you could go and done things that you never thought that you would do. He always has the provision to lead you to where you didn't think you could still go. And that's the goodness of God. And that's what the resurrection teaches us about our failure. But what about our doubts? What about the moments where you're in a circumstance that, uh, for whatever reason, causes you to question everything that you once believed with certainty and now you just seem to have nothing but uncertainty in you. Have you ever been in a place where your whole world got flipped upside down? Where you looked around and you questioned everything? Where you had a lot of questions and there didn't seem to be a lot of answers coming from God or the people of God when it came to the season of life that you were in? Anybody ever been there? Where you've had so many questions that it led you to be tempted, if not fall into complete doubt, at the existence of God. What does the resurrection teach us about the doubter? Well, we get two doubters that are brought up in this scripture in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. We're told that he appeared to Cephas and then to the disciples, the 12. We know that there was a disciple that was uh, restored to replace Judas. His name was Matthias or Matthias, whichever way you want to say it. Uh, just doing some fun Bible trivia. I thought, you know, maybe you want to talk back, maybe not. Okay, whatever. Uh, Matthias, he replaces uh, one of them. But out of the 12, who are we going to talk about if we're talking about doubt? Isn't it funny that you're quick to identify him by his moment of failure? How judgmental of you church people to talk about someone redeemed by the blood of Jesus by the moment of failure. What if we identified you the way that we often identify people in the scripture? Right? Like the lame man's known as the lame man for eternity, yet he walked. The blind man is known as the blind man for eternity, yet he sees. The mute man is known as the mute man, yet he Here. speaks and he can uh, hear. He can hear. The deaf man can hear. I mean, so over and over again, there's these stories in the Bible, and we tend to identify people by their weaknesses because I think the purpose of it is that you and I would be able to kind of see ourselves in their story. And so I want to do a character profile on Thomas. I want to look at other places in Scripture that teach us some of the things about Thomas that we can know. And I want to talk about the doubts and how he got to the place of doubt and how you can maybe relate to that. But there's a second character that's brought up in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. He comes up in verse 7, and it's this guy named James. Now, some people believe there's three James. There's James the Great and James the Lesser, who are both disciples of Jesus. And then there's Jesus' half-brother, James. Some people believe that James the Lesser is James, Jesus' half-brother. I don't believe that. I think there's three that are in the Scripture. And so the question quickly comes up when James is brought into the story is, which James is Paul talking about? Great, less, brother. Which one? Now, for me, uh, I believe it's pretty easy to surmise if a little bit of historical background that he's talking about Jesus' half-brother, James. The reason is, is after Stephen's martyrdom in Acts chapter 8, one of the next martyrs, first martyrs to die in the early church, is James the Great. He was one of the three that walked with Jesus. The other two were James, John, and Peter. James is one of the sons of Thunder, who whenever a village didn't want to receive Christ and kind of rejected him, he's like, can we call down thunder and just go ahead and bring wrath on him? 
I think you can relate to that, right? There's probably been some times where you thought, enough of this grace stuff, God. Let's give it to him. <laughs> Thankfully, God doesn't let you have control over the switches of lightning and wrath and thunder. Because <laughs> many of you, like James the Greater, would do that. But I believe this is Jesus' half-brother, James. Now, we're going to talk about how you can be a half-brother of Jesus that doubts God and then comes to faith in God. So we're going to look at two characters, Thomas then James, and then we're going to look at how the resurrection impacts your doubt if you're one who is doubting today. Are you tracking with me? Let's first start with Thomas. Uh, whenever we bring his name up, immediately everyone goes to thinking that he is a doubter. But there's two other stories that I want to bring into his character profile that I think will help us better understand him. And maybe you'll identify more with him as a result of it. If you go to John chapter 11, we get the story of Jesus and Lazarus. Anybody ever read that one? Pretty interesting story. Jesus in John chapter 10 was in the village of Bethany. And there he made a slightly controversial statement when he said, I and the Father are one. And the priest picked up rocks to throw them at him and stone him to kill him. So they've just left there. They've continued their ministry a ways off, perhaps two, three miles down the road. And as they're in this place, word comes from Lazarus' sisters, who Lazarus, being Jesus' friend, was sick. Jesus kind of speaks in semi-code and says, this will not end in death. And then it says he loved him, so he waited. Isn't that amazing that sometimes the love of God means that he waits a little bit longer? Because in my opinion, when I have a need, if God loves me, he meets the need immediately. <laughs> and when he doesn't meet my need immediately, it must mean that I've done something wrong or God didn't hear the prayer. Now, I know I'm not the only one that thinks this way, because many of us think this way. We've all had moments in our life where we've thought about the fact that we've prayed prayers that were unanswered, and you haven't gotten to your Garth Brooks moment where you realize it's an unanswered prayer at the high school reunion because, you know, she ain't what she used to be, and neither are you. And you weigh out plenty of your coverage. Some of y'all don't know what I'm talking about. It's a country song. Just, just don't, don't even go there. It'll ruin you. Uh, you'll, end up, you'll end up, you know, like, you know, stomping your foot at random times and looking for honky-tonks to go to. It's a really bad slippery path to go down. <laughs> ADD kicked in right there. Nonetheless, <laughs> nonetheless, what, what am I saying? I, I'm, I'm saying that there's times in life where we pray and we don't hear God and we think it's because God's mean. But what if I were to tell you that sometimes God's ultimate goal in suffering and pain and difficult seasons is that you would deepen in your dependency on God. So sometimes he waits so that you can grow in your faith instead of having the instant prayer as if he were some kind of genie that just stopped by and answered. What if I were to tell you that perhaps the silence right now that's going on in your life isn't because God hates you, it's because God loves you and he has, desires a greater thing for you. And as a result, he's allowing this season of pain to root so that he can eradicate it from the roots out of your life. If he medicated it, you would just simply move on, but your trust wouldn't deepen. But because he's waiting, he's giving you the opportunity for the roots to deepen so that on the other side of what he does in this, it can be a greater praise that comes for his glory out of you and a greater faith that you demonstrate in your trust and confidence in him because of what you went through. Does this make sense? So Jesus waits and Lazarus dies. And then Jesus says, after he's dead, let's go now to Bethany. He's fallen asleep. The disciples don't get it. He says, no, he's died. We're going to go now back to Bethany. And all of the disciples chime up and they say, well, why would we go back there? He's already dead. Let them bury him and let's stay here. They want to kill you. This seems like a really bad idea. And in the middle of all of the disciples cowering away from death, Thomas speaks up and says, if Jesus is going to Bethany, we're going with him. And if he's going to die, we'll die with him. <laughs> now, most of us have painted a character profile of Thomas of a coward. But in actuality, he's a person of great courage. He's willing to die with Jesus in John chapter 11. He's willing to, and ultimately, historically, it's believed that that's exactly what he did. He died a martyr's death. In India, professing the gospel for the, perhaps the first time in the country of India. So we know that he's a man of courage, yet we tend to only identify him through one part of his story. In John chapter 14, a few chapters over to your right, if you turn your Bibles there, Jesus begins to talk about his death. None of his disciples got it. 
None of his disciples, I mean, no, no, every disciple was shocked on the night that Jesus was arrested and ultimately crucified. They didn't see it coming. Even though Jesus repeatedly said, I am going to die. Now, I know that you get frustrated about that. and Maybe some of you think that they wrote it in later. But how many of you have told your kids something multiple times and they didn't get it? Exactly. You hear what you want to hear, right? You hear the parts of the story that you want to hear. How do we know that they're not hearing Jesus? Well, they're going to start arguing about who gets to sit beside Jesus when he sets up his earthly throne. Who gets to sit closer to him. And whenever he expels the Roman government and they get to now live life the way that they want to live. But in John 14, Jesus starts talking about what's to come. And he says this. In John 14, verse 3. Let me flip back there. John 14, verse 3. He says this. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself that where I am, you may also be, or you may be also. And you know the way to where I'm going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going. How can we know the way? Okay. How many of you, when it comes to uh, uh, putting together furniture or uh, assembling stuff at Christmas, uh, you know, that Santa drops off unassembled, how many of you... Don't look at the instructions. You look at the picture and figure it out. Okay. You're like probably the other 11 disciples. Where are we going? Just get in the car and I'll tell you. Do you want to punch it in the GPS? I don't need GPS. I looked at a compass. It said north. We've got to go from here to here. Let's go. Right? Uh, there's a lot of us that are that way. Now, how many of you are, we're going to read the instructions, we're going to plug it into the GPS, we're going to plan out the vacation. What are we doing at 11 o'clock the first day of vacation? We're going scuba diving. What are we doing at 103? We're resting. <laughs> and you get flustered when people don't stick to the plan. Anybody in here like that? Okay, you've got different groups, different types of people. Off of the story of Lazarus, we can summarize from Thomas' character profile that he is a person of great courage. He's willing to die. In fact, I would submit to you that he's extremely loyal. He's extremely loyal. I think that's part of his character. But Thomas is the kind of person that before he commits, he's going to ask an extra question. Some of you were in class where you didn't understand anything the geometry teacher was doing on the board, yet you never asked a question. So... <laughs> There's a student that God providentially put in that class that raised their hand so that you wouldn't get a C, which equal degree, and maybe you would actually understand circumference or, you know, <laughs> something like that. And they did what no one else was willing to do. This doesn't make sense. Could you clarify? Could you give us an answer? Now, let me differentiate something. Today, we're talking about how the resurrection circumvents your doubts. But some of you believe you're a doubter when you're actually just a questioner. God never turns someone away that has questions. He doesn't reject us because we have questions. In fact, Thomas gives us credence to think that he puts people on his team that ask lots of questions. I believe Thomas is a person of great courage, but he's the kind of person that's going to ask a question before he commits. But once he commits, you'll find no one more loyal than Thomas. Right? If he were an Enneagram type, I tried to type in an Enneagram thing on behalf of Thomas. It came out as an Enneagram type 1. Any of you ever done the Enneagram study? It's basically a personality profile. Okay, like three of you and the rest of you don't care. But nonetheless, he's, he's a 1. If you're a 1, maybe you relate really well with Thomas. He's the kind of person that he has questions, but once he gets answers to the questions, he commits. And when he commits, he doesn't let up. And the end of Thomas's life would speak to that. Now... The upside of asking lots of questions is that you get lots of answers. But the downside of asking lots of questions is you can be prone to doubt when you don't get the answers you want when you want them. And I think this is the upside and downside of personality types. Every one of them that you read always has some strengths, and then with it, there's weaknesses. Maybe you're a charismatic person that you know, can captivate a room, but then you're a people pleaser, so you don't deliver difficult information. So there's an upside and there's a... A downside that comes into it. The disciples are no different. They're human. They have upsides and they have downsides. Peter reacts and then he apologizes. What's good about it? Stuff gets done. What's bad about it? Some details get left out. Right? From time to time, some details get left out. And you can relate to that person. And in the same way that you can perhaps relate to Thomas. Now, in John 20, this story of doubt comes in. It's all in the book of John. We get the character profile of Thomas. And this is the first day of the resurrection. 
Uh, Jesus has appeared to the women at the tomb. Uh, he's also appeared to the disciples. And here's what we know about Thomas in his uncertainty and his doubts. Okay? Thomas is not around the community of God when Jesus shows up. Therefore, he's allowed a space for doubt to be incubated. The quickest way to allow doubts to root in your life is to isolate away from people who can remind you of the big picture. Now, while none of the disciples are sitting in the upper room the first night of the resurrection getting it, they have questions. They're not rooting everything in doubt. There's plenty of things that are uncertain. Jesus is alive, apparently. He just appeared to us, apparently. Does he hate us now because we all abandoned him? These questions have not been answered. They're likely being circulated in the room. Yet what is certain is that Jesus just showed up and didn't appear to one or two, but appeared to all of them that are in the upper room. Thomas isn't there. And because he isn't there, he shows up to the party late. And this leads into the questions turning into doubts. And we're going to differentiate between the two as we look at this. Look at it with me. John 20, verse 24. It says this. Now Thomas, one of the twelve, called the twin, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see in his hands the mark of the nails and place my finger into the mark of the nails and place my hand into his side, I will never believe. This is strong language in the Greek, and he probably said it in Hebrew. It was translated into Greek whenever it was written. And so he is literally saying, I refuse to believe. I'm not asking a question. I am rendering a statement that says, Unless God meets these conditions, I will not believe. It is impossible for it to be real unless these things are dealt with and answered. And so he's moved from questioning God to doubting God. Do you see the difference? If I have a question, let me explain because none of you said yes. If I have a question, that means I come to you anticipating that there could be an answer or that you could have a solution to the thing that I'm coming to you about. If I have a doubt, I dismiss you and consider it impossible that you could have an answer or that it could be a reality of what you could do. Thomas starts in John 14 asking questions. Where are you going? We don't know where you're going. In John 20, he says, it's impossible. Why? Because he's seen crucifixion. He knows what it does. Now, we have no record of him actually being at the cross of Christ's crucifixion. But he's grown up in a Roman-occupied country. Around 5 AD, there was an uprising in Jerusalem. And uh, uh, several people were uh, crucified throughout the streets that were a part of the uprising. They would catch them, sentence them, and crucify them right in the street. And then they would leave them there for 40 days. So I want you to imagine growing up in a culture where you're going to the store... And there's a neighbor that decided to defy the Roman government, and there they are on the cross suffering. And then after they're dead for days, as they decayed and birds ate of their flesh, they're just hanging there. When you hear Jesus was crucified, are you thinking three days later, he's walking around eating, appearing, and talking? No, it seems impossible. Now, we've, all, we've already talked about last week the hand of providence. And God throughout Scripture providentially moves in several, several texts, uh, meaning like the story of Ruth. We never see God like step in and do a miracle, but providentially he covers them, protects them, provides for them. He gives Ruth and Naomi passage back to uh, the, the homeland. And whenever they get to where they're at, he provides a field for Ruth to glean in and a kinsman redeemer named Boaz that would ultimately redeem him. But we never see God step in and God says or God moves. But then you go back to Exodus and there's another thing about the way God moves in history and time. And sometimes he doesn't just providentially move. Sometimes he steps in and does amazing things. Sometimes he parts waters Sometimes he leads us with a cloud of fire by night and the cloud of his presence by day. Sometimes you're in a desert place and he rains down manna. So there's the hand of miracles and there's the hand of providence. And God moves in both. And we often want God to be miraculous when we want him to be miraculous and providential when we want to still be able to do whatever we want to do. You ever notice that about yourself? We're peculiar people. We really are. We want it both ways, but just we want God to know which way, when we want it that way, at the right time that we need and want it, when we want it, immediately. <laughs> Is that asking too much? 
right? And, and, and so we have this road of doubt that sets in with Thomas. And my point is simply, if you had seen what he would seen and you were struggling, you would probably be about in the same place, doubting whether or not God could. I mean, we've seen Jesus raise someone from the dead, but what about himself? I mean, he raised Lazarus, but he's in the tomb now. How's he coming out of the tomb? We, we, we've seen Lazarus raised from the dead because he died of a sickness, but of a crucifixion? I mean, that was the most brutal of deaths, the most painful of ways to go. The word excruciating literally means from the cross. You don't come back from that. So Thomas is in a position that because of what he has seen, he has now been put into a place of doubt. Maybe you can relate. Maybe you believed, but then you saw something so egregious in the world that it caused you to question everything. I mean, isn't this one of the most common human questions? How can God be good and so much suffering and evil exist? How can God be good and Holocaust have happened? How can God be good and there be p- people in countries that are dying of hunger? How can God be good and there's more slaves on the earth than there have been in the entirety of human history today than there were even back in the day? Have you not ever thought this, asked this question, or been brought to even the temptation of doubting the very existence of God because of those realities? I do want to submit to you, when you bring these questions up, that they're valid, that they're good things to ask, but they often point into moments of a huge story that's way bigger than any single one of them. We look at things that shape our world and our nation, but our nation hasn't always been around. And the story of God is bigger than a nation. It predates the nation, and should Jesus tarry, if our nation were to ever fall, it would continue in spite of the fall of our nation. It's bigger than a moment. However, usually in these injustice claims that we bring up against God, we shake our fist at God for not intervening in the moment. Now, what's peculiar about us, once again, is that we want God to intervene and stop people from exercising the volition he's given them. That's a big word for will. In that moment, yet we don't want God to violate our volition in our own lives and our own doing because we want to continue to live the way that we want to live. Now, we know clearly under Scripture that uh, God is sovereign over all of time. He's written Genesis and Revelation, and we have beginning and we have the, the end. So he's bringing this thing to a glorious end. He's promised it, and given the fact that he's come through in all the other promises that predate Revelation, you probably should pay attention. Don't end up being like the people in Jerusalem 398 years or 99 years after the book of Malachi is written going, oh, he ain't coming, he ain't coming. Two years later or a year later, guess what shows up? The promised one of God on a silent night as prophesied in Micah, in Bethlehem, in the city of David when no one was looking and no one was expecting it. Took the king off off course and then the king tries to snuff out Jesus but guess what? It was prophesied that he would grow up in Egypt. And so they run off into, back into Egypt, connecting the story of what Jesus came to do as the greater Moses to what he was going to do as he now came to live. Oh, I could go all day on this subject. This is a fun one. All prophesied, all called for, not known by the people that were experiencing the story as it was happening. But providentially, they look back, and now we look back and see how it lined up and how it was called for in advance prophetically in the Old Testament. All I'm trying to say to you is if you want God to intervene here, yet you want God to not violate your volition here, you can't have it both ways. Now, God gave us the capacity under his sovereignty to choose to love him or to reject him. We all have chosen rejection. We all have, like sheep, gone away and walked away from him. That's scripture, not my opinion. So if you're mad at me, you're just mad at Isaiah. That's okay. It's God's word right? We've all abandoned. We've all walked away. God gives us common grace. What is common grace? Common grace means you don't immediately get what you deserve most of the time. Uh, You sin and you don't die. Congratulations. That's common grace. It's not saving grace. It means that God offers it to all of us. It's the only way any of us have the opportunity to observe, to fail, to learn, to to come to the understanding of our need of a Savior. And so God gives us the opportunity to choose to love him or reject him 
within his sovereignty. He gives you a will. None of you are going to stand before God at the end and be able to go, well, God made me sin. You made me do it. You just willed that I would sin. No, you're culpable for your sin. You chose to sin. The book of James says that uh, do not look at God when you are tempted and blame him as if he caused you to fall into sin or he was the tempter of your sin. For God is not tempted by sin, but you, because of your flesh, are tempted, enticed by. You enjoy sin, and whenever you are tempted, you sin then roots whenever you act on that temptation, and instead of trusting God, you trust in the flesh or you trust in your own ability to get what you lack or what you think you need in that moment. Therefore, you turn from God, and when you turn from God, you turn to sin. Let me be very clear. When it comes to the greatest of atrocities in the world, there is a story that stands over all of it that says, no injustice reigns forever. This is how God can be good and injustice happen. Because everything's coming to his court. Some of y'all are afraid of Judge Joe Brown. Some of y'all are afraid of having to one day stand in front of some other judge or be on night court. Anybody remember that show? Or <laughs> being in some different kind of court. God's going to have court with all of creation and all of history. And the reason God is good is he's going to bring everyone into the court and they are going to get, either by grace and the blood of Jesus, what Jesus has earned or what they deserve. So how can God be good and suffering exist? How can God be good and pain be a reality? I would submit to you that God is good because he allows us to love, to choose to love. He also, with our volition, allows us to choose to turn and hate and as a result of his goodness, he chooses to give us redemption and access to that redemption. It's freely offered to whosoever would believe. But we have turned to our sin and we have walked away. The grace of God is that he offers salvation and redemption to us. And the goodness of God is everything ends up in his court. Have you considered your court date yet? Matthew gives us a picture of it where the nations are brought before him and they're separated from the right and to the left, the wheat and the tares, the sheep and the goats. The Bible paints it as a real picture and a real day in history. Doubt it like the people in the Old Testament doubted the coming of Christ. Find yourself, just like the Old Testament people did, caught off guard. Jesus taught this in parables, that there's going to come a day when no one expects it, that the, wedding, that the groom is going to come for the wedding feast and many people will not be prepared for that day. Why am I spending so much time on this? Because many of us in our self-righteousness have shaken our fist at God and said he's untrustworthy and unworthy of trust. Yet, in reality, what we've not done is thought. We look at a single injustice and dismiss God instead of thinking. And when you think and you look at the big picture, it changes things. I'm not saying that injustice isn't evil and terrible and bad. I am saying that my God is righteous and good and just. And he, in his sovereignty, continues to move his will forward in spite of a people and a creation hell-bent on working against him, who, who he continues to, in spite of them, bring his story to fruition so that the end will be coming when he, when he desires for it to come very soon. So Thomas doubts because he's seen things that he can't reconcile. Maybe you doubt because you see things that you can't reconcile. But then we get this guy named James that pops into the story. James is the half-brother of Jesus. And he doesn't start believing God. Because many of us, we started in belief and then we moved to doubt like Thomas. But others started in doubt, but can a doubter move to belief? Well, if you look at the story of uh, James, we get a pretty interesting thing. In Mark 3, 21... We're told, first time his family's brought up, Jesus is preaching and ministering, and his family, hearing about his ministry, uh, has this response to it. Mark 3, 21, it says this, And when his family heard it, they went out to seize him, for they were saying, He is out of his mind. Real quick, some of you are crazy Christians, and you're crazy, crazy Christians, but how many of you have ever felt, felt like God was calling you to do something, and the response was more like this than praise? Anybody in the house? Right? If you got two witnesses that are crazy like me? All right. I went and told my family I was moving to California, and my, my granddad's response was, I can't believe you're moving to the land of perverts. <laughs> You've lost your mind. 
Uh, my friend Lee, who's one of our worship leaders at the church that moved out here with me, he told his dad that he was moving to California. And he, he said, I can't believe you're moving out there with all those crazy liberals. You're going to become a liberal. You're going to get piercings. You're going to lose your mind. He, I mean, completely lost it on him. <laughs> Professes to be a follower of God. This is the things he said. I looked at my dad and said, I think God's calling me to go to California to, set, to start a church, uh, to reach people that are far from God with the gospel of Jesus Christ. And he said, our family doesn't do that. Here's what I'm trying to say. If there's not a point in time where lukewarm people try to seize you over being white hot for God, then you may not be pushing hard enough. That was free. Nothing to do with the message. I'm just letting you sit in it for a minute because I'm seeing some of you thinking, Holy Spirit working. Now they come out to seize him. So let's just say that none of Jesus' family is thinking, ah, son of God. Right? I mean, let's just vote real quick. How many of you have ever thought your sibling has lost their mind? Really quick. Okay. How many of you have ever thought your sibling was the son of God? It's funny, but it's a strong apologetic because it happens. How does Jesus' unbelieving family go from this point in Mark 3 to James, Jesus' half-brother, being the leader of the church in Jerusalem and dying a martyr's death. I would submit to you it took the gospel. It took the gospel. By the time we get to Acts chapter 1, we know that Jesus' family has begun assembling with the disciples in the upper room, waiting on Pentecost in the Spirit. So if you look at Acts chapter 1, verse 14, it says, All these with one accord were devoting themselves to prayer together with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and his his brothers. They showed up in doubts, but now they're showing up in faith. They don't know what they're going to be involved in in the story of God necessarily, but they're here. Why? Well, there's this mention in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 of Jesus appearing to about 500 people at one time. It was likely in Galilee that this happened where the majority of his disciples were. And chances are there's reason to believe that Mary and, and Jesus' brothers were there so how do you go from doubt to belief? Well, your brother dies a, a, a Roman death on a cross and then three days later starts showing up again and meeting with you and appearing with you and talking to you. That would probably bring me to a place of conviction. Are you tracking with me? So much so that by the time you get to Galatians, uh, Galatians, chapter, uh, Galatians chapter 2, this is what's attributed to, I believe, Jesus' half-brother James. And when James and Cephas and John, who seem to be a pillar of the faith? Wait, you've gone from Jesus has lost his mind to a foundation, a pillar, a, a, a person in which God's building his kingdom and his church on. How does that happen? So here's what we know so far about doubt. You can start with belief and end in doubt, and you can start with doubt and end in belief. What's the difference between the two? Well, some of you have already heard these stories before. And if you go back to John 20, after eight days of bearing with Thomas, Jesus shows back up in the upper room. And look at how quick Thomas's doubts dissipate. In John chapter 20, eight days later, his disciples were inside again, and Thomas was with them, although the doors were locked. Verse 26, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands and put your hand and place it in my side. Do not disbelieve, but believe. believe. Thomas answered him, you sure are you Jesus? Yeah, ain't the real Jesus. The real Jesus, stand up. No, no. Immediately, immediately, he says, my Lord and my God. He doesn't call him his leader. He calls him God. Can you hear the faith just leap out of him in this moment? Maybe at first he followed him because he was a great teacher. But now he's saying, you leave me because you are my God. You're my leader. You're my Lord. You're my ruler. You're my king. He goes from doubt to faith immediately. Now, some of you are like, well, that's all I need then. So Jesus, show up. Y'all welcome. No, like how many of you have said that, right? Like if I could just see what Thomas saw, I would not have doubts. I would believe. Anybody ever said that? Okay, no one. Sweet, we'll just move on. 
I know every single one of you have thought that. Easy for them to believe. They got to see it. And I'm just supposed to take their word for it? I'm just supposed to believe blindly that all of this is true? I mean, how, how, do, you, how do you get that, tr- how do you, that trusting of anyone? Just take their word for it. I mean, this seems ridiculous. Well, I would submit to you that you have underestimated the power of belief and the power of faith. Many of us, we, we, we hear, blessed are those who believe and they haven't seen, and we think, oh, we got the shorthand of the deal. Let me give you some of the things that the disciples didn't have, okay? They didn't have access to the Old Testament. They couldn't read it. Some of them perhaps were illiterate. The printing press doesn't come around until the 1500s. So you had a verbal tradition for the most part because the scrolls and books were rich people privileges. So if you had a book, you were rich because you commissioned someone by hand to write it down. And it was more than likely a scroll, right? I mean, how, how do you keep people, keep people down? You keep them illiterate. I mean, this is how you don't let a slave in America discover what they really are according to the gospel. You proof text and keep away from them the parts of the Bible you don't want them to read that are about their freedom and their liberation. And so because they can't read, they have to be informed of it. And one of the biggest freedoms that came was having it. When we had the printing press and books, that's when uh, Martin Luther was able to go and knock the theses on the door of the church because they had drifted from the gospel and begun to go back into man-made speculation. What do you have? I mean, how, how can you believe? Here's what I want you to see. Belief is not blind. Faith isn't blind. Faith isn't just, well, we hope. You don't have a good definition of faith if that's what you think. Well, we hope it's that. No, faith is filled with hope, but there's a purpose for the hope. What's the reason to believe? What's the reason to have faith? Well, we have the Word of God. And in the Word of God, we have two things. We have prophecy and firsthand testimony. What are the prophecies? The prophecies spoke of the type of birth, the type of death, and the type of return that Jesus would have. The birth and the death of Jesus have been fulfilled, and they were prophetically called hundreds of years in advance. And you have access to that whenever you want. You read thinking it is a right when it, in their culture, was a privilege. The second thing you have is the eyewitness accounts of people who lived one way and had their life eclipsed by the resurrected Christ, and their life was completely changed. Why do I have faith? Why do I believe? I cannot explain how a brother who thinks his siblings lost his mind then dies a martyr's death professing that his sibling is the Son of God. If you take resurrection out, It doesn't make sense. Some people say, well, he got involved in a lie that made his life a lot better because he got to be a leader of a church, and we know how leaders of the church get paid. (laughs) Do you really? You really want to know that? You want to compare bank statements? You want to compare generosity? I'll play with you, sucker. (laughs) The church of Jerusalem was broke. They suffered. It wasn't pleasant. If the lie was to benefit their comfort, they would have recanted it a long time ago. James then, on top of that, is taken to the top of the temple. This is historically believed. You can read this in the book, uh, Evidence That Demands a Verdict by Josh McDowell. And there's been a rewrite by he and his son, Sean McDowell. It's an incredible book, a great resource. Every Christian should own it. They take him to the top of the temple and they shove him off the top of the temple because he wouldn't recant that Jesus was the Messiah. He falls, breaks both of his legs. They come down to him in his suffering. They say, recant. He refuses to recant, and then they kill him as he confesses Jesus as Lord. Explain that. Well, that's one guy. Well, let's bring up Thomas again. Historically, it's believed that after this interaction, he, on the basis of what he sees, goes on to India and dies a martyr's death professing the gospel of them. Many people believe he was put to death by the sword. How do you explain that? Or Peter, who's crucified upside down because he doesn't believe himself to be worthy to be crucified in the same manner as Jesus Or the guy we're going to meet next week, Paul, who ultimately loses his head for the sake of the gospel. You see, we we don't have belief that's based on nothing. We look at the evidence. You see, most of us take one philosophy class in college and we drop our faith.
Because some guy in corduroys that stands up there and spouts off at the mouth reading one book by Frederick Nietzsche, all of a sudden everything gets thrown out. And that's partly my fault. And our fault as pastors because we, we have tickled your ears because whenever we go deep sometimes you don't show up. Whenever we try and do sermons that explain the historical reliability of the Bible or the deeper things theologically that answer some of the questions, you don't want to know it. So because you want to remain a, a child and an adolescent in your faith, we cater to that instead of calling you to grow up so that you can be prepared to give an answer. So some of that's on me. So while we spent 10 weeks last year on an entire series called Liar, Lunatic, or Lord, going on the historical liability of the Bible, uh, the, the role of men and women in the church, spending time answering these questions that come up as objections to the gospel. I had one guy at the end of that series, he came to me, he's an agnostic, and he said, I just, I hate you, and I love you. And I said, well, thank you. And, and he, here's what he said, here's what he said to me, he said, I hate you because you have an answer for all of my questions, yet there's other people that continue to repudiate what you say, so I don't know what to believe. And I'm like, I can only take you so far. You never cross from death to life without a step of faith. You never cross from doubt to belief without a step of faith. It always involves a step of faith. No matter what evidence is there, even though there's more evidence for the reliability of the life of Jesus than there is for many of the people that we read about in our history books. And I can show you Yet you believe they existed. Even though there's more historical liability for this, you, it still doesn't mean you're going to believe. It doesn't mean you're going to cross over to faith. Oh, I love this discomfort. I love taking on the little college professor that read a couple of books and got a degree from a tech school and thinks that he's figured it all out and has no more questions in life. Oh, I have a field day. My question is not, is there evidence? My question is, do you understand the power of your faith? You are promised suffering and pain. The gospel doesn't eliminate hardship. Every disciple died a martyr's death but John. They boiled him alive and they couldn't kill him. You want to follow Jesus? Don't follow him because you think your life is going to be easy. Don't follow him because you think everything's going to be peachy. Don't follow him because you think everything's just going to work out and like, you know, it's just going to be this easy thing. No, follow him because he's God. Follow him because he's Lord. Follow him because he's risen from the grave. Don't pursue a blessing from God. Follow him because you get relationship with God. That's why we follow. What does faith do in our doubt? Because there are going to be moments where you suffer and you go, is he really here? Has he forsaken me? Has he turned away? You've all had him. I remember having the first crisis of faith in fifth grade. My aunt got diagnosed with liver cancer. Her skin turned yellow. She suffered. We prayed for healing. We prayed that God would heal her over and over and over and over again. And then we changed the prayer because it didn't seem like healing was going to come for a physical healing here. So we started praying, God, take her. But he didn't take her. So God, you won't heal her, but you won't take her. What's going on? Would you just do something? So she suffered, and in her suffering, I remember as a fifth grader going, God can't be real. He must not be real. I mean, I remember the, the overwhelming doubt that consumed my mind in that moment. What does faith do in that moment for the believer? Faith takes what seems like it's everything, this moment of suffering, and it pulls you back to see that there's a bigger picture in everything. Faith, here's what it empowers you to do. It empowers you to understand that though there is suffering in this moment, God will not let it rain in eternity. Therefore, I can still believe because outside of this moment, there is a track record of faithfulness that God has demonstrated. A track record of him coming through where I did not anticipate him coming through. A track record of him being able to do what I did not think was still possible for him to do. And because he did it then, that track record gives me reason to believe, reason to have have faith that in this moment that feels forsaken of God, that he's still here, that he's still present. You see, faith is not something that I have because I need to can't hold on to a weak, a weak uh, religion or a weak faith. Faith is something that I have because it's how I overcome doubt in the moment. It's how we exercise it. So maybe you're here. Maybe you're in the place where you're like, God, it just doesn't feel like you're here. 
Maybe you're the kind of doubter where you're like, God, I, it's not that I don't believe you, exi- you don't exist. It's that it seems like you work for those people, but I'm one of these people, and I just doubt that you care. And if you're there, I want to submit to you that the resurrection teaches us that this is why you've been given the history of God, the faithful track record of God, so that you can see the big picture whenever the mountain that you stand in front of seems to be all you can see. Mm. The second thing I want you to see is that, and I want to be very careful about how I enunciate this because I'm from the South, and so sometimes I under-enunciate things and people thought I said something different at 8 o'clock, <laughs> is that doubters don't get put on the bench. God doesn't bench doubters. How do I know this? In Matthew chapter 28, some of you say, if God would show himself to me, I would believe. Here's the problem. He showed himself to a ton of people. And in Matthew 28, as he got ready to commission them with his commission, look at what it says. Matthew 28, verse 17, it says, they came to him in the place where he told them to come. And when they saw him, they worshiped him, but some doubted. Notice what it doesn't say in verse 18 or 19. It doesn't say, so God said to the doubters, how dare you sing and worship me when you still have questions? How dare you expect something from me when you still have doubts? No, there are people singing that right now have conviction that God is in control of everything, and there are people singing that are going, God, I I need faith. I need you to help me. I need you to show me your providence, and I'm not sure. I'm not sure how or where or what, but I'm still singing and I'm still praising because for some reason I believe you're still good and you're still God even though I'm going through what I'm going through, even though I'm experiencing what I'm experiencing. God commissions doubters. Therefore, you don't have to sit on the sideline because you come up with a question or because a philosophy teacher raises an issue that causes you to question everything about your faith. You can continue to be in the community of God, worshiping God with your doubts and continue to be used by God even as you're working it out. In fact, I would submit to you we would have a more powerful testimony and witness if we would be honest about the fact that there are some things in the way God does that we don't understand or comprehend on this side of eternity and we're not trying to figure it out or put it up as a... uh, 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 something God has to meet in order for us to move forward. I believe we've got to get back to understanding the difference between petition and a demand of God. We petition God, but we don't make demands of God. We petition God in that we bring our worry. We bring our pain. We bring our questions. But we don't have the right to demand that God move and meet our conditions. There's the word. We don't have, so some of us have conditioned that if God doesn't do what we want him to do, that we're not going to follow him. But we have been called to petition when we don't know what to do so that we can know what to do to follow him moving forward. And so simply put, God doesn't put doubters on the bench. And then finally, your dead ends, your doubts don't have to be dead ends. And this is what I would submit to you. Your doubts don't have to be dead ends. James doubted in Mark 3.21. It wasn't a dead end. Thomas doubted in John chapter 20. It wasn't a dead end. I was so lazy about my faith in college. If it wasn't simple and easy to understand, I would just assume it was babble. It didn't matter. I never took it upon myself to actually research and look deeper and dive deeper. I didn't understand that sometimes the question was to send me on dates with God to discover more about him, to learn more about him, to grow relationally with him. So how do you not let your doubts become dead ends? There's three things I would give you in it. If you're still taking notes, if you've got any capacity left, and you still hear the words coming out of my mouth, it's anything other than mere noise. Notice where Thomas is when his doubts grow. Right? He's not with the disciples. He's in isolation. He's trying to reason for himself. He's not asking questions. He's not in community. So the first thing I would challenge you to do if you're in doubts, if you don't want to become a dead end, is continue in the community of God. Embrace community. Why? Because there are times where I need to borrow your faith and you need to borrow mine. Just being honest. Right? There are going to be times where I need... You, to continue to remind me of the gospel, to remind me of the faithfulness of God because I am so consumed by what's in front of me that I can't see anything else. And you all know that person. You've been that person because there's been moments where people have tried to reason with you, but you couldn't see anything other than the stuff. And whenever they begin to speak, you're like, I know, I know, I know, I know, I know, I know. 
Because you don't want to see anything other than the stuff that's right in front of you right now. But the community reminds you of the big picture, number one. Number two, you push in prayer. You make your petitions. You don't give conditions to those petitions. you got to do it this way, God. No, he doesn't. He's God. You're you. He's really good at being God, and you have a history of really good at not being God. I know there's pain here. I know I'm talking about perhaps sin that was done to you that you're like, God, why not go there? Why not intervene? And, and, and carelessly will a lot of times throw in cherry-picked verses into those things like, well, God works for the good of those who love them. And it's that, it, it almost renders a passivity in your faith. When, when, it, when in reality, the beauty of what, what we have in Christ in every season is direct access to the throne room of God. A high priest that is greater than any other high priest you could have who even it says in Romans when you don't know what to pray he whispers the prayers of what you can't even utter into the ear of the Father for you. (laughs) So some of you have doubts and you push away and I'm saying no, when you have doubts you pull in. You pull in, you embrace community, you press in in prayer And, and and then finally you read and study the Word of God. You read and study the Word of God. Why? Because this privilege, and I can't understate this, this privilege is not shared by the majority in this world. I mean, today, people are going to die trying to get this into someone else's hand. That's how deadly it is. The Quran doesn't get cut off in cultures. The teachings of Buddha doesn't get cut off in cultures. You can't get Bibles into certain parts of the culture, though. You know why? Because if they were to read it and know of the gospel of Jesus Christ and know that they don't have to climb the mountain to God, but God came for them. As one man in India replied to a pastor that was training leaders there, He was speaking with Hindu leaders, and the Hindu leader said, if God came to us, it would be the greatest news ever. And my friend, who's a minister, looked at him and said, that's what's in this book. (laughs) He came. Why? Because you are suffering. So he bore your suffering. Because you are in pain. So he took our pain. Why? Because this current struggle was never meant to be your eternal struggle. God's heart, his desire was that you would be reconciled to him and have a relationship with him. So what does the resurrection do for our doubts? It reminds us of the big picture. It teaches us that God doesn't walk away from us when we have great questions and great doubts of him. And it teaches us that our doubts don't have to be dead ends, but can be the very proving ground where our relationship roots deeper than it's ever been. Our ministry team's gonna come forward and they're gonna lead us in a time of response. If you are struggling in doubt, I invite you to the altar and we'd love to pray for you this morning. If you've never given your life to Christ, you don't have a relationship with Jesus, I believe the starting point in all of this is relationship. It's not rule keeping, rule memorizing, it's relationship. And I believe that Jesus desires to have a relationship with you. He demonstrates it through his life and death on the cross. And if you don't have a relationship with Jesus, I believe he's inviting you today to leave your old life behind and come forward and receive him. We're in a season of God moving. We've seen people come into Christ every week now for about five weeks. Yeah. And so if you're far from God, you've come to the right place. I believe this is a homecoming day. And all that stands between you and that homecoming is you standing and coming forward and saying in faith that you want to put your life into his hands, your forgiveness into his hands, your payment for your sin into his hands, your future into his hands. And if that's what you want to do, leap up out of your seat as we stand and sing this song and you move as the Lord leads, whether it's for prayer, whether it's to the altar, whether it's to surrender your life today, you move as Jesus leads. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand.